A 50-minute drive southwest of the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth lies the town of Granbury, Texas, where in 1943 the artist-to-be Vernon Fisher was born. When Fisher entered college, it was as a math major, but he quickly changed to literature, and then on the brink of graduating, an art class again lured him to switch his major. From the specificity of language, Fisher plunged into the expansiveness of abstract art. After completing his MFA, Fisher had a daily quota of hours he devoted to what was deemed his serious abstract work, which after fulfilling, he would then turn to lighter entertainment in making small illustrated books. The tug of literature was ever present and eventually he abandoned abstraction in favor of artwork more directly rooted in everyday experience and incorporating text and literary techniques to inform his practice. Fisher now calls Fort Worth home, as do several of his artworks in the permanent collection of the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth, including Private Africa, from 1995, which will be the focus of this week's edition of Slow Art. Private Africa is composed of a collection of disparate images and scribbles of varying styles and content painted on blackboard slating. The piece is a large, nearly perfect square approaching eight feet tall and wide. The base of the piece is a map of Central Africa after the 1919 Treaty of Versailles that divvied up the African territories Germany lost during World War I to the British and French. Precise lines of longitude and latitude intersect the piece while the names of the places form a loose pattern. Thin, organic white lines mark rivers while thick and transparent rust hues mark boundaries between territories. Boldly overlapping this backdrop is a photorealistic depiction of a parachutist painted in blue and white, and to the right, a delicately drawn collection of broken lines form a waterfall that dissects the canvas vertically. Behind the foreground of these images are scribbled writings, calculations, and geometric shapes representing the marks left from erasures on a blackboard. Above a faint sketch of what looks like a watermill are some words that appear to be wiped away but with patience, one can decipher a line that reads, Africa is the dark continent, followed by beyond the Sahara, and one couldn't pass. The color palette of this piece is limited and cool. The flatness of the backdrop is contrasted with the delicacy of the waterfall and the three-dimensional ballooning of the parachute. Though a visual artist, literature would remain a huge influence in Fisher's work as many of his practices spring from literary tropes, and as such, his work provokes reading as much as it does seeing. So let's take a look at how literature, and metaphor in particular, informs Fisher's artistic practice, the ideas that motivate this approach, and the potential readings which result from this intricate piece. A metaphor is a linguistic tool used to give meaning to the world around us, to make it visible. The metaphoric dichotomy of light and dark, for example, goes beyond describing actual brightness and serves to make abstract phenomena visible, as can be seen in the following expressions. A white lie, the black market, black magic, the dark ages, the enlightenment, a black hole, to be left in the dark, and to see the light. Fisher takes metaphor a step further through the use of metonymy to guide how he builds up his pieces and metaphysical poetry and how it cultivates meaning. Metonymy is the use of an aspect of something to represent a larger idea. For example, in the expression, lend me your ears, ears are a stand-in for one's attention. Fisher uses metonymy to allow an aspect of one image to lead him to the image which will succeed it. For example, Starry Night from 2013, shown here, is built upon a map of constellations. The idea of gazing at the stars leads to the image of the space observatory. The slit in the observatory then evokes the Mickey Mouse piggy bank figurine, then leading again to the cartoon figures which look starstruck. This process is the same for Private Africa, where we can see aspects of each image overlapping with another. The downward cascading parachutist mirrors the vertical momentum of the waterfall. The waterfall conjures the power of water which could have provoked the inclusion of the watermill form in the background. These loose connections build complex layers of visual imagery on the surface of the piece. The images Fisher uses come from a massive archive of over 15,000 images he has assembled over the years from a mixture of sources, some of which include Hollywood films, comics, illustrations in encyclopedias, and his own photographs. 
The images tend to fall into two categories, of the familiar and comic on the one hand, as exemplified by Mickey Mouse, Hollywood film stills, and the swimming pool in Stockton, Texas, depicted here, or the exotic and disastrous on the other, as demonstrated by Amazon explorers pulled from an encyclopedia, or plumes of smoke from a nuclear explosion. Fisher often reuses imagery in many of his pieces in the same way that a writer repeats words. As Virginia Woolf would write in 1937, words do not express one simple statement, but a thousand possibilities. The images become the visual vocabulary Fisher uses to explore how symbols gain new meaning each time they are juxtaposed with other images. This exploration of metaphoric meaning leads us to the second major literary trope of metaphysical poetry, which we can see in Fisher's work. Metaphysical poetry uses unlikely, ironic, and paradoxical rhetorical combinations, often including science and technology. This excerpt from T.S. Eliot's Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock illustrates one such application. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table. Framing the spread of evening upon a landscape with the spread of a patient on a table forces the reader to reevaluate what relationship these symbols may have when placed together. This literary trope capitalizes on the natural inclination of our minds to create connections between things that are presented to us. Just as Eliot is asking us to connect an etherized patient and a sunset, Fisher is asking the viewer to do the same with a waterfall, a parachutist, mathematical calculations, a colonial map of Africa, and writings about a dark continent. Fisher anticipates that the viewer arrives at each work with prior cultural literacy, which allows them to recognize the images they are confronted with. But in order to gain the significance of each in correlation with their context, it is instrumental to examine them anew. So let's unravel a few aspects of private Africa in their possible readings, the relationship between them, and their significance to Fisher. Let's begin with the map. Fisher frequently uses maps as backdrops to his work. For Fisher, maps are an attempt for us to locate our place and our perspective in the world. The subjective practice of map making highlights our responses to ourselves and others and the ephemeral quality of borders that separate what lies within and without. The map used in private Africa references the European colonial presence in Africa and the implied relationships among Europeans and Africans. The waterfall conjures the sublime beauty and soft force of nature in the way that it batters the rocks below, but also assumes the shape of the terrain behind the flow of water as it disintegrates into mist. The parachutist evokes World War II images and subject matter and film noir in the austere contrast of light and dark shadows. The parachutist is protected yet unknown, and therefore we are unsure whether this is a sign of something ominous on the horizon or salvation. Both the parachutist and waterfall reference downward movement while also contrasting the controlled falling of the parachutist and the power of the waterfall. Falling signifies a change in altitude, but it is also used to refer to a fall in status, the defeat or end of something, or a loss of control. It is as much a signifier for the alteration in spatial position as it is of status. These two entities seem to be at odds with one another, and the sense is heightened by the angle of the parachutist descent inevitably leading toward a collision with the waterfall. For Fisher, the choice of blackboard slating as the backdrop for this piece indicates the space where ideas are worked and reworked. The thoughts found on a blackboard are informal, speculative, and nonlinear, and when they are erased leave a faint yet perceptible shadow of what was written, marking the history of ideas just as changing borders on a map leave their histories on the land and people. The faint writings of Africa as the Dark Continent reference Joseph Conrad's 1899 novel Heart of Darkness, which recounts the protagonist's journey up the Congo River. The title, Heart of Darkness, refers to the journey through a territory unknown to the protagonist, as well as the darkness which lies within each individual. This small excerpt from the book reveals the narrator's ambition to travel into the heart of Africa. Now, when I was a little chap, I had a passion for maps. I would look for hours at South America or Africa or Australia and lose myself in all the glories of exploration. True, by this time, it was not a blank space anymore. It had got filled since my boyhood with rivers and lakes and names. 
It had ceased to be a blank space of delightful mystery, a white patch for a boy to dream gloriously over. It had become a place of darkness. This novel mirrors much of Fisher's own curiosity about the world outside of Granbury as a young boy, but it would carry much more significance, which we will come to shortly. As we look back at the piece as a whole, Fisher has put metaphor to work in his visual language to challenge our understandings rather than elucidate them. Though representational, Fisher considers his work to be abstract, as the images are divorced from their usual context, rendering them somewhat indecipherable. Rather than fitting the parachutist into a more common narrative of heroism and victory, we are asked to reevaluate this figure as it floats next to a waterfall over Africa, all the while referencing Conrad's Heart of Darkness. The context within which the images are placed requires the participation of the viewer to re-examine them. Rather than looking to find truth in a painting or piece of work, Fisher challenges the field of narrative painting as his work does not tell a story, but instead it remixes one. The impetus for Fisher's work is seated in his own early life. Growing up in small town, everyone knows everyone, rural Texas, the inclination was to blend in, to camouflage into the greater social fabric of the community and accept the way things are. But there was one thing in Fisher's family that would rupture that acceptance. Fisher's father was a Methodist while his mother was a Baptist, a significant difference in that time and place, which meant that compromise had to be reached between the two perspectives. If it was possible to modify and mix perspectives, then it would follow that both were simultaneously legitimate and arbitrary. And if this was true at home, it would also be true in the world at large. The ultimate result was that no ideology could be infallible or have a monopoly on truth. This idea germinated in young Fisher, and he would later combine it with the idea of the shadow developed by psychologist Carl Jung, which would serve to further question common cultural narratives. The shadow, according to Jung, is the darker side of ourselves which we are unaware of or refuse to acknowledge and project onto other individuals and groups as a defense mechanism. This concept is evident in Conrad's Heart of Darkness, where the narrator is confronting the darkness within himself, but also projecting darkness onto the land and peoples of Africa. In an interview with Fort Worth Weekly, Fisher says, If you grew up when I did, Africa was known as the Dark Continent. This is maybe an example of a racism that pervaded the whole country at the time, and probably maybe still does. In other words, we can't acknowledge our own shadow, so we project it onto a whole continent. The Nigerian novelist Chinua Achebe reflects a similar perspective in his 1977 critique of Conrad's Heart of Darkness when he writes, Africa is to Europe as a picture is to Dorian Gray, a carrier unto whom the master unloads his physical and moral deformities so that he may go forward erect and immaculate. Fisher is not trying to communicate a specific political position, despite the specific political implications that this piece does carry. Instead, he is asking the viewer to engage in the exercise of interrogating the symbolic material that is used to construct our cultural narratives. In essence, the political implications, whatever they may be, are a byproduct of investigating our individual and collective shadows through the symbols we are surrounded by. Through Fisher's work, and in particular, Private Africa, he has teased out dichotomies of civilization and nature, knowledge and speculation, the separation between us and them. His work is positioned within a limbo state where the familiar becomes abstract, where the line between literature and visual arts is blurred and investigated, where narrative is freed from linearity, where metaphor is the engine for the creative practice, where knowledge is sought out through breaking down the very processes of arriving at knowledge. As viewers, we are confronted with our shadow and ask to examine how we have arrived at the perspectives we are so certain of. <laughs>